I'm Chip Waller. Welcome to Lunch with a Lawyer. I believe this is our 14th session. We've been doing this a little over a year, and so uh, we are welcome any questions that you may have. Uh, if you post them to the Facebook page, well, we're live and we will try and answer them right as we speak. Uh, I usually try and pick out a topic uh, to talk and uh, talk about and hopefully uh, it, it's something that you'd be interested in is uh, what do I, uh, do I need to probate a will? And so we'll be talking about that today, but I wanted to let you know that we're going to be changing the name of the firm to the Law Office of Roland D. Waller, uh, and we're transitioning from the Waller and Mitchell uh, that's been that way for the past 20-some-odd years, and that Mr. Mitchell's been retired for a couple of years, so we're going to go with the law firm of uh, law office of Roland D. Waller. So uh, I've got to get used to that because I've been talking about Waller and Mitchell for a long time, uh, but uh, we still have the same phone number. We still have the same website, and so nothing's changed, and I'm still right here. We have uh, Erica Munns, who is handling guardianships and uh, taking over uh, Mr. Mitchell's clients as far as that's concerned. So it's not be any a drop off. Again, if you have any questions, well, post them to Facebook, and uh, I have uh, Josh, who is the producer here, and he's monitoring this, and he'll give me a heads up that if anyone has a question about anything, uh, I'll try and answer it or tell you I don't know uh, don't know the answer, and uh, to tell you to call me and leave a message, and I'll call you back and try and refer you to someone. So turning to the topic today, which is, do I need to probate a will? Well, there, there are any number of variations on this. As many times people, when they sign wills, believe that, that they are, ha, can avoid probate by signing a will. And that is a myth, and that wills may have to be probated, even if, uh, you know, just because you have a will doesn't mean you avoid probate. Uh, the reason why you would need to have a probate proceeding, whether you have a will or don't have a will, is if there are any assets that are just in the decedent's name alone, so that you are unable to transfer, sell, or do anything with that asset uh, is the reason that uh, you would have to go through a probate proceeding, whether or not it is uh, whether or not you have a will or not. What the will does is it facilitates a probate proceeding if there is an asset. Uh, the asset, uh, the will designates who you wish to receive the, your assets, and it may be a, what they call a specific device in the will that says, I leave my house to uh, my daughter. Uh, that would be a specific device, or it would say that I devise ten thousand dollars to my uh, granddaughter uh, that would be also a specific device so wills can designate who to whom you want your assets to be distributed sometimes you I get the question about whether you need to probate the will they call up and say well I'm the only heir or my sister and I are the only only two that have any interest in this so do I need to probate the will and the answer is yes what the will will do will, will be the link between the decedent and then who is going to receive the asset uh, after they pass on. With real property, the, the, once the will is admitted to probate, the title to the property vests the instant of death into whoever the designated beneficiaries are under the will. Now, the, the title to the property can be divested uh, as a result of creditors and, and uh, has to be liquidated uh, unless it was the decedent's homestead property. But uh, probating a will is uh, something that uh, you may, you, you do have to do as far as getting the, uh, having the assets be distributed to a beneficiary uh, who you 
who's designated under the, the will. But, but it logically is, is how do you know who's supposed to get the, the asset unless the will is admitted to probate and it's in the public records. Now, many times with the uh, uh, homestead property, that's where the decedent lived, uh, that has a special, uh, is handled differently than other real estate if the decedent didn't, uh, as far as their homestead is concerned. Uh, the Florida statutes talk about uh, the home and passing uh, to, if it's devised under the will, to a, a family person uh, or a, a, a blood relative, well, then it passes to the blood relative without uh, any, the creditors cannot claim any interest in the homestead property. Now, that's not to be confused by uh, having a mortgage on it. Josh has given me a heads up that someone's got a question for me, which I very much appreciate. It's sort of lonesome out here in front of this camera, so. Mr. Well, the question is, how often should I change my will? The question is, is how often should I change my will? That's an excellent question, and I get that off, asked often, probably not often enough, however. The answer is, is whenever there has been a change in circumstances as far as your beneficiaries are concerned or as far as your financial being is concerned, whether your assets have increased substantially or unfortunately have decreased substantially. And uh, so those are the times whenever you would do that. Many, most of the time I'm dealing with folks where there's been a change in the who they want to be beneficiaries, particularly uh, with grandparents and say, well, you know, my my son, he's doing really, really well, and I really want to make sure uh, set up something for his college uh, for the for the my grandchildren, and so uh, that's whenever it was one of them. Uh, tragically, if you would lose a child, sometimes you would uh, need to look at your will to see whether or not uh, you need to make a change as far as providing for the your the decedent's widow or their children. Uh, sometimes uh, after, particularly if it, there's been a remarriage and you lose your spouse, depending on how the uh, deceased spouse children or your stepchildren have treated you, you may wish to change your will to reflect different beneficiaries. So it's usually a change in the, uh, in the your family and uh, what has transpired there. From time to time you have children who make some bad decisions uh, as far as uh, life is concerned and uh, have you know, pr certain problems and or some children may have a spend, you know, have a problem managing money and you want to make some sort of provision for them. So those are some of the circumstances as to how often you need to do it. I recommend you reviewing the will. Uh, try and do that uh, maybe once a year. Leave your, don't put your will in your safe deposit box. Keep a copy out so hopefully you'll look at it about once a year and to just see if it's the way you want it. Also, uh, if you had minor children, you waited so long that they're now adults, you may want to change who your executor is. So. Uh, and you don't need guardianship. Josh has another question, and I really appreciate you all sending in questions. The question is, is my will still valid if my spouse passes away and I have not updated it? The question is, and I don't know if you can hear Josh, but anyway, they wanted to know whether or not the will is still valid if you lose your spouse and uh, you haven't updated it. The answer to the question is, is prob yes, uh, probably. Uh, most wills provide that uh, it says that I leave everything to my spouse. And then the next paragraph says, in the event my spouse predeceases me, uh, then I leave everything to my three children or whom you leave it to. And you also usually name your spouse as your executor and the alternate personal representative or executor. And so it's not a problem as far as the will being valid. Uh, we would just need a death certificate for your deceased spouse 
as well as your death certificate when you pass away, and it would then show whom uh, you want your assets to go to and also who you want to be the executor. I would urge you to check in with your attorney or hopefully me and review your will to see if there are any change in circumstances as far as who you want to receive your Uh, also uh, what they call a health care surrogate. That's where you designate someone to make health care decisions for you waiver. And the third is a durable power of attorney so that if you would have any incapacity that you would could avoid a, uh, a guardianship and have Josh raised his finger again, so we're getting some good play today, and that's great. And what's the third question, Josh? If I've done documentation on a website, I'm off view of those documents. Hopefully everybody heard Josh, but uh, so I don't need to re repeat it uh, like I did the first two. The answer is no, uh, we don't. Uh, we, we'll be glad to look at them, but as far as me looking at them and telling you that, well, yeah, they're just fine, particularly as far as your will is concerned, I could probably do that as far as your and so if it has the uh, statute, I could. I could also pontificate or talk to you about whether or not some of the other provisions will be followed, but you know, with a living will, that's something that it's up to the medical community. Uh, with a health care surrogate form, that statute's been changed recently, and sometimes with these websites, they combine the two, uh, but uh, probably could look at that to try and sort all that out. And as the uh, will is concerned, that's particularly critical. What we have found, depending if you use Legal Zoom or Rocket Lawyer or whatever, by the time I go through and try and analyze all this, uh, the the fee for me redoing them and 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 explaining and all that is probably going to be just about what you, you know, cost the same as if you didn't have them, uh, as far as that's concerned. So. Uh, it's somewhat dangerous as far as, I think it's dangerous as far as going to a website, uh, particularly as far as the execution of a will, and that uh, that has to be done with certain formality, and if it is not, the will may not be effective, and also does, you know, discuss the operational effects of it. I haven't even talked about taxes yet, so there's another question. Yes, Josh? What types of documents do I need to have when Adam guy here in your children or who the beneficiaries are. Uh, the other, uh, some of the other uh, things that you need to do is know how your, what assets you own and how they are titled. Do you have them titled in, in your, your name and jointly with someone else in your joint names? Are they payable on death? Do you have life insurance? Uh, and do you have an IRA? So all of these documents is very helpful if you have them. All the primary uh, thing that you need to have is who you want the beneficiaries are. I have, and we could send to you if you want, a fact information sheet uh, for you, could, you know, to fill out to, to bring all this information in. Uh, I have my own bias as far as having to fill this thing out and ask you know so many questions it's sort of a hassle but 
If you would like, we could probably send you an information sheet to have you fill out all the information and, uh, and then spend our time chatting with you uh, about uh, your estate plan. Now, usually in a estate planning conference, spend a few minutes talking about estate taxes, the federal and the lack of federal estate tax the non-existent of Florida of estate tax, and then I talk about how to title your assets, which is important to bring those documents with you. So most people want to know, well, can I avoid probate? And so to see about how to title the assets. So uh, in following up with some of the other questions, if you lose your spouse, that's a critical time to possibly to come in for another estate planning conference so that you know or talk about, well, if you have a functional family and you just want your two or three children to receive your assets, well, how can you set those up so they'll automatically go to your, to your children? Uh, you know, particularly with deeds or property, if you own your home, it's titled in your name, well, is there something I can do so that the, the property will pass directly to my kids upon my death without adding them to the title as joint tenants during your lifetime. And yes, there is, and that's another estate planning tool. I think the operative words is estate planning, planning, planning. And so by doing that, uh, you plan on how the estate can be automatically passed to your beneficiaries without the need for probate. So these are, uh, that's what, why they call it planning. And if you lose your spouse, well, that's a really a good time to come in, talk about updating your, your will and what your estate plan is, whether you need a trust or whether you need to use that. I guess Josh has another question for us. If a relationship status changes from a fiance to a spouse, does the estate planning have to be redone as well? The, that is another terrific question and you all are uh, really doing a great job of asking questions and the answer to, to that is, as I suggest it, yes, you should uh, come in and redo your estate planning documents and, and more importantly, uh, as far as estate planning is concerned, to uh, check on the status of title to, to your assets. Uh, whenever you become married, you, you, uh, you can create or hold title to assets as tenants by the entireties. That is a biblical concept that's been carried over from the English common law. It's been incorporated in the uh, Florida law. And so when you get married, you become as one and that's called tenancy by the entirety. So a married couple owns an undivided interest in whatever assets that they hold as husband and wife or tenancy by the entireties. Uh, whereas if you own the property uh, prior to marriage and you own it as uh, joint tenants with right of survivorship, each of you own a one-half interest in the property. So that uh, there are certain benefits as far as owning assets as tenancy by the entirety. Also, with a will, uh, depending on if your prior will said that you left everything to your spouse uh, or left everything to your fiance, uh, well, then it's not critical as far as who would receive it upon your death if you had any assets just in your name alone. Uh, however, if you didn't provide for her in what they call in contemplation of marriage, well then uh, the, your fiancé would then have certain rights to claim against your estate as far as that's concerned. But I think it would be a terrific idea uh, to go ahead and uh, look at how you have your assets titled as well as you know, looking at your, your uh assets or, or your estate planning documents. So uh, hopefully I answered that question and it was a segue into talking about tenancy by the entireties. Uh, what are the benefits of tenancy by the entireties? 
uh, you uh, can, uh, if there's a judgment entered against either spouse, just one spouse, and you hold assets as tenants by the entireties, that particular asset cannot be attached by the creditor if it's held as tenancy by the entireties. So that's critical or, or a nice asset protection uh, way of protecting your assets, particularly whenever you look at the billboards up and down 19 where they everybody's wanting to look at automobile accidents. So to that end, uh, that's, uh, an automobile is a dangerous instrumentality and so the owner of the vehicle, if it's involved in an accident, can be sued. So I suggest that if you have a, uh, more than one vehicle in the family that you uh, place uh, each vehicle in, in the name, title it in the name of whoever's driving it. And so that way that the, uh, if the driver's involved, he may get sued and is also the owner, whereas if the drivers involved and the vehicles owned jointly, well then both of you would be, could be sued because it's a dangerous instrumentality. So uh, that's just a little bit of asset protection. Don't suggest you run out and change all your titles immediately, but just sort of keep that in mind whenever you swap around cars or buy your spouse a new car, well just title it in her name if that's what she's going to be driving and that way uh, you can uh, keep your assets and uh, hold your assets as tenants by the entireties. Most real property that is held, uh, you create a tenancy by the entireties by titling your asset as husband and wife, which is how most spou uh, uh, married people uh, take title to real estate, which creates the tenancy by the entireties. What you can do also as far as bank accounts are concerned, you need to make that designation on the signature card. Now that is critical, so you check with your bank the next time you're in and say, well, is this, uh, uh, how do I hold title to this? I saw a YouTube uh, presentation and the presenter said that uh, we could designate this to be Tennessee by the entireties, and most banks offer that, and so if you could change or designate that, that would be good for you as far as a little bit of asset protection. If banks only offer joint tenants with right of survivorship and you are married when you establish the account, uh, then it can be shown that you intended to hold it as tenancy by the entireties. But I think any most banks, and, you know, I'm not sure which ones don't, but many of them do offer the, the account to be held as tenancy by the entireties. So that is a uh, something you might want to look into. I'm not sure how long I've been rattling on here, but you all had some great questions. Uh, we've had about, um, been on uh, chatting here for about 25 minutes, and so uh, if anybody else has any questions, that'd be great. And uh, so I uh, really appreciate the uh, participation and uh, looks like we got a, a pretty good topic this, uh, this time. And so I look forward to seeing you uh, next, uh, next month on the second Tuesday of the month. Also, uh, for the viewers of this YouTube, if you're out of state, I'm a Florida lawyer, so everything I'm talking about is only Florida law. So my, if you have a question, well, give me, we got a question? Yeah, all right. It's never too late. As long as we're on the air, I'm always game for another question. What is it, Josh? At what age should you have a will? At what age should you have a will? Well, you can't have a will until you're age 18. So the... The, your circumstances in life uh, as far as a will is concerned would probably mean is do you own anything and from the time you own anything well then you can have a will uh, and designate who you would want to receive your assets. So I would say any time after age 18 would be a good time to start thinking about it and uh, as far as that's concerned. Also your estate planning documents such as a power of attorney may be very, very helpful, particularly if you're out of town or you want someone else to be able to take care of signing for things, particularly if you have, uh, as far as digital assets now, you have to have particular language in a power of attorney 
for digital assets, uh, but uh, hopefully answer that question when you're age 18. Josh has another question for me. You're doing good today, Josh. <laughs> Is a video will less valid than a written will? Is a video will less valid than a written will? A video will is not valid. You, you know, right, the, the, this past session in the legislature, uh, uh, willing.com, I believe, sponsored or had legislation passed by both legislatures where you could have an electronic will or do the, have your will signed electronically. And so, and you, uh, however, that was uh, vetoed by the governor. So if you just video what you want done with a will, that doesn't work. Now, if you're talking about having whenever you physically sign the will and you video the execution of it by you and the two witnesses who are present, well, then uh, it doesn't make it any more valid or not valid. But if you simply have a video and you state even in the presence of two witnesses, that this is what you want done with your estate or whatever, that is not considered a valid will. Furthermore, uh, we have what they call a what's called a holographic will. That's where you sit down and you write it out in hand. And if the holographic will or a handwritten will is not signed in the presence of two witnesses, which is a requirement under Florida law, it is ineffective. Now, there are some states that do recognize holographic wills, but Florida is not one of those. So I don't know quite what is meant by video will, but if it's simply talking into a video and telling what you want done at your death, that isn't going to be sufficient and is not going to be uh, uh, available uh, or not be able to be probated as far as that's concerned. So. Well, how are we doing on questions, Josh? We got any more coming our way here? That was an interesting one and certainly timely after the, this past legislative session and that I believe Las Vegas is the one that has now had these, these wills that can be uh, done with electronic signature and, and they are uh, videoed as far as uh, are called an online will. Problem in Florida with online is we don't have online notarization and this legislation uh, you know changed what the law has been in Florida for the past you know 150 years so uh, there's it may be something in the future but it certainly has a few kinks to get worked out one of which is the notarization remote notarization and so that uh, some legislation is going to come in to take care of electronic notarization since we do recognize electronic uh, signatures or there is a, a uh, the Florida statute to recognize electronic signatures. Okay Josh I guess we're going to hang it up uh, and again remember that I'm a Florida lawyer I only know Florida law I know where the other 49 states are I can spell most of them, but I don't know what the law is as far as that's concerned. So if you have any questions about Florida law, uh, just give me a call. My name is Roland Waller. It's Chip Waller. Everybody, the IRS knows me as Roland, and everybody else knows me as Chip. So you can call me at 727-847-2288, and I'll be glad to help you out uh, or send you this try and give you somebody, uh, if I don't do it, tell you who to call. So until next month, well, we will see you uh, then.